Hello and good evening and welcome to Cambridge Skeptics Live. Cambridge Skeptics are a not-for-profit educational organisation for the promotion of positive scepticism and science and critical thinking and all that fun stuff. Um, a couple of little announcements before we jump into it this evening. Um, this is going to be our last show for a little while. Um, there are people on holiday and uh, Sam and Erica are having a baby in a really inconvenient time. But, you know, uh, so we're going to be taking a little break for a while um, and hopefully be back with some more stuff in a couple of months. Um, also, I'd like to uh, promote a friend of the channel, I Can Science That. He's recently put up a series of videos called Realizing Euclid Step-by-Step -step Test. Um, he's trying to get people to go on there and fill in some very, very simple questionnaires in order to do some hypothesis testing. And I really recommend you pop over there. I put the link down below if you're interested. Okay, on to tonight. And we are very excited to have Tom uh, Kirst back on with us this evening. Uh, Tom is a best-selling author, TV celebrity, you know, astronomer, all round amazing person. And we're very excited to have him back on to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll hand over to you, Tom. Wow, that was that was so much guff. It's all round amazing person. Oh yes. my goodness. You don't know no me at all, <laughs> clearly. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Andrew, for the introduction. And thanks, uh, thanks to Cambridge Skeptics for inviting me back. It's really a pleasure to come back, to be able to talk about something that's just so exciting it's very easy being a science communicator working in the world of astronomy because basically everything you talk about looks amazing looks beautiful you can just put pictures up and everybody's kind of going oh. unless, and unless you're really a medium of what you podcasting say. right like the visual medium is really helpful it's really helpful it's just such a beautiful subject and um the astronomers that work on the on this uh, in this field they are aware of that you know they take pride in being artists of a certain fashion. So that means that I can share some artwork with you, which is very scientific in nature, very beautiful, but also very in, uh, informs us of a great deal. Um, not necessarily things that we didn't already know, but there are some surprises. And um, what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about this incredible mission that's just kicked off really, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, and then talk a little bit about the first images which were released last month. Um, just before the middle of July. Uh, so I've got those images that I can share with you, got some slides, I can show you those and I want to talk around them a little bit. And then if anybody has any questions about the telescope or questions about the state or future of astronomy, perhaps um, I would be most happy to, to tackle those. Uh, I think I may have said this the last time, so this might be a tired joke, but uh, if I don't know the answer, I can make up a very convincing answer on the spot had years of practice of that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm very honest. Okay, so I'm going to um, just share my screen here. Oh. Also, that's an awfully large door you've just left open. Like, oh yeah, the future of astronomy. The future of astronomy, that's it. Yeah. The whole topic. The, the whole future. Yeah. The whole topic, yeah, that's a... That's it. <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, it is a big topic, but at the same time, it's kind of all going in the same direction. So it's quite easy to talk around it. Um, okay, so can everybody see my Ooh. screen? Can everybody yeah, see exactly. infinite versions of my screen receding into themselves? Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so I don't know if you can still see me. Hopefully not, because um, it's not great for you. But uh, we, we actually can. Just FYI, like if you need to like pick your nose. Oh, okay, I will be. I'll be very. I'll be on my best behavior. Yeah. I'll be on my best behavior. I was just about to have some guests walk behind me. Not. Yeah. Wearing yeah. Them. If anyone is like you know having a shower in the house, just 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 let them know. I'll let them know. I'll be careful. I'll be careful. Just avert your eyes and and focus on this beautiful imagery in front of you instead. So. <laughs> So James Webb Space Telescope, um, I'm sure everybody watching this has heard of it. It would be impossible not to have heard of it. Um, and part of the reason why it's impossible not to have heard of it is because the people behind it are so good at communicating what they do. Um, the JWST, as we call it for short, is essentially a, a collaborative effort between three large agencies, government agencies. So we have the most famous of all, NASA, which is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the US. Um, then we have the Canadian Space Agency, CSA, and our very own European Space Agency, ESA. Um, and I should say for UK viewers that we are still in ESA. ESA is not an EU organization. Our membership to ESA isn't contingent on our membership to the EU. So we still remain an active 
part of the European Space Agency. So the JWST actually started life, um, the twinkle in the eye of astronomers back in the 90s, um, as a kind of follow-up mission to the very successful Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope itself is a product of the 90s, really. It launched in 1990, uh, sent back its first image data in 1990. It's still going, and it's still going remarkably strong, and it's a true testament to not only the incredible engineering of the telescope, but the maintenance that uh, that was done to it. Um, JWST cannot be maintained in the same way because it doesn't orbit close to the Earth, but I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, but I will say that when it started life, it wasn't called the James Webb Space Telescope. It was called the NGST, which is the Next Generation Space Telescope. And that proposal was first made, I was a wee lad, it was, what, 96, I think, when the NGST was first being talked about. But by the time I went to university to do my undergrad in 2004, uh, NGST had been renamed the James Webb Space Telescope, and it was well on its way. It didn't happen quickly. The whole project took quite a long time. So just bear that date in mind, 1996. Fast forward to December 25th, Christmas Day of 2021. Uh, so that's 25 years after it was first proposed. And finally, the James Webb Space Telescope has completed construction, uh, has been loaded onto this beautiful um, Ariane 5 rocket. By the way, um, the Ariane 5 is, you know, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a rocket nerd, and most rocket nerds will agree this is one of the most beautiful rockets ever designed. If a rocket can be sexy, then the Ariane 5 is the sexy rocket. That, I mean, that... there are some obvious metaphors. We can draw them. Maybe we won't to keep things uh, PG. OK, yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, it's long your imagination. So the SpaceX ones, which are a little bit stopping. Right. It's much more beautiful than the SpaceX rocket. Sorry, Elon, but this is how to make a rocket look good. And the Ariane 5 is the flagship heavy lift rocket from Ariane Space, which is a French aerospace company. They work very closely with the European Space Agency, and they launched this one from French Guyana, actually, um, and where they where they operate a launch facility. And um, you can see that not only is it a beautiful rocket and a beautiful photo and beautiful lighting on the photo, but you can also see flags from the European Space Agency or flags rather from the various countries that actually contributed to the launch and the construction of web along the side. So it just, I think it's a lovely image because it shows the, the incredible international cooperation that was required to make this project a reality. And I think it's important to just keep that in mind because when you look at the news, you'll very often hear about the NASA web telescope. You hear about the NASA Hubble. Hubble was also operated, built and operated by the European Space Agency. And ESA doesn't really seem to get enough credit globally for what they do. So there are many nations involved and small countries can make huge contributions to these things and, and they deserve the credit. So after the launch of the JWST on Christmas Day, after it was pushed back, um, I actually had the opportunity to go out and see the telescope in the sky. I'm not sure how clear this will be, but I hope that um, on the YouTube playback, you'll be able to see this. Uh, I've put some sort of purple rectangles here on the screen with some labels showing two dots progressing into the sky. And this is a time lapse of photographs um, spanning about 45 minutes compressed into a very short space of time, just a few seconds. And what you can see here are two very, very faint stars that seem to drift in the sky, whereas all the other stars stay still. You can see a few other dots moving kind of to the top right. Um, those dots are um, are dead pixels on the sensor. So that's just a tracking issue rather than, rather than actual uh, signal data. But the JWST there is seen traveling out into space about 24 hours after its launch um, and also followed by the upper stage of the Ariane 5. So rockets are launched in stages. Uh, they drop bits uh, as they get higher and higher because once the fuel tanks empty out, they're just dead weight, so they drop them, leave them behind. And the upper stage of the Ariane 5 was sort of the final rocket motor designed to push Webb out towards its final parking orbit, its station, as we sometimes call it. And that's an, a strange place for it to be because it doesn't orbit around the Earth like the Hubble Space Telescope. It technically orbits uh, around a, a point where there is nothing. Uh, it's called a Lagrange point, and it's a, basically a gravitationally stable part of um, the Earth, Earth's orbit around the Sun. So there are several Lagrange points around the Earth. Webb orbits around one called L2. And so you can sort of imagine Webb is sort of co-moving with the Earth around the Sun. So it's close to the Earth at all times, but it's still about a million miles away, which is about four times the distance to the Moon. So nobody is going to be going up and servicing Webb 
Web is a, is a one-shot mission. If something goes wrong, then it goes wrong. Things have already happened to Web since it arrived at its station, but nothing uh, has drastically affected its performance. And there's really nothing out of the ordinary or out of the expectation uh, value that has occurred. So there is really no reason to fear Web having some sort of drastic issue at this stage. And presumably, there's some advantage in having it out at, at this Lagrange point rather than having it be closer where it could be serviced, right? Yes. So there's a huge advantage and, and you'll see actually I'm gonna I'm just gonna skip around here but to make this easier to understand. You can see a, a mock-up here, a visualization of what the web telescope looks like. Now it is it is huge, it is vast in size. This little model you see here does not do justice to the to the scale. And if you were to stand next to it, you would be shocked at how large it actually is. On the top there is a gold plated mirror in 18 segments, uh, hexagonal segments, and that mirror has a diameter of six and a half meters from top to bottom or side to side. So you can imagine these, these large uh, sun shields beneath it, which are made of this ultra thin uh, foil material, they must be absolutely huge. And indeed they are, and there are five of them. And those sun shields allow Webb's instrument package, which is behind the gold mirror, sort of out of view here, uh, along with its optics, the mirror itself, to remain nice and cool. And when I say nice and cool, I'm talking about 50 Kelvin which uh, that's 50 that's cool. degrees above absolute zero. So that's around minus 220 degrees, basically. Um, to maintain that incredibly cold temperature, Webb needs to keep one side pointed permanently at the sun and the other side pointed permanently away from the sun. Um, but with Hubble, it's a different situation. You see, Hubble orbits the Earth. And so as it does so, sometimes it's in the shadow of the Earth, but sometimes it's in full sunlight. And so it is not designed to operate at an ultra low temperature like Webb. So it can orbit the Earth, and that's not a huge issue. But Webb needs to maintain a, con a constant super cold temperature. And so being at this L2 point, it's able to get into a stable orbit with one side always pointing towards the sun. It also doesn't actually have to deal with the moon as a source in the sky, which means Webb never needs to worry about looking um, away from the moon to protect its optics. Um, so that's just another advantage as well. So there are, there are several reasons why telescopes like this would be parked at L2. Um, but Webb was was designed that way from the beginning. Actually, I should mention that originally the NGST, the Next Generation Space Telescope, was planned to have an eight meter wide mirror. So it has been pared back a little bit. And if you're wondering about the name, well, James Webb was the administrator of NASA between uh, 1961 and 1968. So he's often credited with being a driving force in order to achieve the success of the Apollo missions at the end of the 1960s. Um, and that seems very timely right now because the Artemis mission which is the sequel to Apollo, if you like, which is kicking off very soon, is uh, is actually running up to its first test launch, Artemis 1, at the end of August, if all goes well. Uh, they expect that um, tomorrow, at the time of recording now, so we're at the 16th of August now, on the 17th of August, it's expected that uh, that rocket may roll out from the Vehicle Assembly Building in Cape Canaveral in Florida and be taken out to its uh, launch pad site, essentially, which is really and exciting. How sexy is that rocket? Sorry? How sexy is that rocket? On oh, that's scale? a sexy rocket as well. I don't have a okay. picture of that one, but you can look that up on your own time. You know, just make sure you close the curtains and uh, don't don't let the neighbors see. But to yeah. celebrate, I do actually, I am actually drinking my coffee right now out of my Artemis mug. Ooh. So this is the Artemis mission logo. Um, Artemis is uh, is the sister of Apollo in mythology, so that's where the name comes from. And Artemis, of course, will take women to the moon for the first time, which is very exciting. Cool. So fast forward from December 2021 to July 2022. And in December of 2021, um, those of us who, whose job it is to try and interpret what astronomers do for the media, we're talking to news anchors and journalists and saying, look, it's very exciting, but telescopes don't switch on straight away, especially a telescope like Webb. Webb needs to travel to its station before the mirror itself can be unfurled, a very delicate operation. Um, and then it needs to do something called commissioning, which is a very long process. So that involves cooling the telescope right down, testing all of the instruments, testing all of these routines where the instruments can reboot themselves if they fail, um, and also adjusting the individual segments of the mirror in order to achieve the best and sharpest possible focus for the optical system. So when all of that commissioning was done, then and only then, months after its launch, could astronomers begin to take images. And the acquisition of those images was done in secret, essentially. But astronomers did announce the, the target list 
um, a little early. And that kind of snuck out under the radar. It was reported on, but many people didn't really uh, look into that. But I was quite excited about the target list because I could see that the first images to come out from web were going to represent the extraordinary diversity of objects that web is designed to look at um, and designed to get the best view of. So this was actually the first image to be released, uh, the first full color, should we say, image to be released from JWST. Um, and this is an image of a galaxy cluster. It's a little bit of a busy image. So not everything in this image belongs to the galaxy cluster. In fact, the galaxy cluster really represents just the kind of white fuzzy stuff in the middle. Um, and the distance to that is about four billion light years. So that's a very, very distant source. Um, but what's beautiful about this image is that we can see that this cluster, this fuzzy bit in the middle, is actually causing the objects behind, the galaxies behind, to be stretched out of shape. And this is just an optical illusion. This is called gravitational lensing. So the light that's coming from behind that galaxy cluster is changing direction as it travels around the galaxy cluster. And that's because the mass of that cluster, the mass of those galaxies, the, the mass of something we call dark matter, which is, which is a much greater contributor, all of that mass is turning the space in between us and the background into a giant lens. So there's effectively a giant lens in space, four billion light years away, surrounding a cluster of galaxies. And that lensing is causing the background galaxies to be stretched out of shape. So you can actually see objects that look like galaxies. They look like spirals of stars, but they're just completely warped, you know, kind of like if you were to put them in Photoshop and, and, and get a tool that's designed to just smear the, the image and just drag that tool around. But there is structure to, to the shape. And actually, this is an image from Catherine Haymans. She's a professor of astrophysics at Edinburgh, and she serves presently. She is the Astronomer Royal for Scotland. And she used modeling data to um, unpick this image and to reveal the various galaxies that are being multiplied. So you can see all of these numbers on the screen here, and they're all sort of digit dot digit. So the left digit is the is the number identifying the galaxy, and the right digit is the copy, the number of copies of that galaxy. So for example, on the left, you can see a galaxy denoted 1.1, .1, but beneath that, you can see 1.2. It's the same galaxy, but that's the second image. And further down towards the bottom of the image, um, as it is orientated here, you can see 1.3. So again, that is galaxy number one, but it's the third image of the same galaxy. So that's actually just the same galaxy being seen three times as the light is essentially refracted around this invisible lens in space. So this is a real cosmic target. And this image from Webb went far beyond, in terms of resolution and depth, anything that had been achieved before in such a small region of the sky. So when Webb does return its first ultra deep field image, it will probably reveal millions, hundreds of thousands, or perhaps millions of galaxies in a single photograph. Hubble has kind of set the record with around 10,000 galaxies in a single image, but I expect Webb is going to go much, much further. And, and was that photo, what was the reason for choosing that as the first photo? So you talked a bit about mm. how the, sort of the diversity of things it can cover. Yeah. Well, in terms of the order that they release the images, I can't say for sure, but what I will say about the what is particularly special about this image is that one of Webb's mission goals is to look for the earliest light to propagate through the universe. And because of the way that the universe is changing shape, light propagating through the universe changes color as it travels. And as a result, galaxies that are very, very, very distant from us, they don't actually shine in the kind of colors of light that we see at all with our eyes. They shine in the infrared only. And a telescope like Webb is designed to detect that. But the previous generations of telescopes that could achieve this sort of resolution weren't able to detect, to detect that. So comparative to an image from, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope, this one reveals so many more galaxies at, at a great variety of stages of their evolution, but particularly very, very, very ancient galaxies, which, which are actually young as we see them, but, but they're very, very distant. So we, we get to see, um, we get to peel back the curtain on more of the kind of young lives of galaxies. And also it will just help us to understand more about the density of matter in the universe itself. And I'll come back at the end and talk a little bit about the kind of pillars of web science, but that is one of the major pillars of the, of the web mission design is to be able to see these early galaxies. 
so following the release of this image which came out in a it was a painful experience to be honest it was presented by the the president of the us um it was late it was it was hard going they decided to release this image a day before the rest and it was it was like really hard going because the the presentation was late we were all staying up waiting for it um everybody wanted to you know be popular and meme it. So I created this, you've probably never seen this template before, it's completely original. Um, I created this extraordinary work of art and put it out there. And then many people stole my idea and made more popular variations because they have more followers and just cashed in. But th <laughs> apparently that's how the meme economy works. I don't think it's very fair, but there you go. But the purpose was kind of to highlight that, uh, well, in the past uh, 200 odd years, we've made a lot of progress in our ability to observe uh, and interpret infrared radiation in the universe. So on the left is a picture of uh, William Herschel, uh, English astronomer, um, sort of posing in front of his giant telescope, which is the insignia for the Royal Astronomical Society uh, in the UK. And you can sort of see him performing an experiment with a prism here that's splitting light into its component colors. And on the left side of that, we have red light um, and then it becomes invisible because we can't see the colors of light beyond the red. But he's using a thermometer here to measure the existence, essentially, for the first time of radiation that is outside of the visible spectrum, but which heats things up. So the discovery of the infrared is credited to Herschel probably late 1700s, but the paper is around the 1800s, uh, around 1800 that he first announces it. Um, and then by the 1830s or so, astronomers are starting to try and detect infrared light. There's kind of a problem with trying to detect infrared light, and it comes down to how we sort of think about infrared light. Um, think of it this way. Infrared light is, is the radiation that we feel as heat. When you go outside and it's sunny and you feel the heat of the sun, it's infrared light that you feel. Infrared light actually has a lower energy, though, than visible light. And we'll talk about why in just a moment. But in physics, visible light, the light that we see, is actually physically hotter, more energetic than infrared light. So we don't tend to sort of think uh, intuitively about the nature of infrared light. It's not that infrared light is energetic that makes it feel hot. It's that it's very easily absorbed uh, that makes it feel hot. And so when the radiation is absorbed in our skin, uh, we, we feel that radiation, it, it imparts energy into the molecules that make us up, and we feel that as thermal energy. Uh, unlike visible light, which of course reflects off our skin, and rightly so, because if it didn't, we, we wouldn't be able to see each other, so it's, it's quite helpful that it does, and our eyes are tuned to that. So understanding that infrared light is actually a low energy light is important, and understanding its wavelength is important, so um, that's something that we'll, we'll come to. In fact, we'll come to it now. Um, this is a, one of two slides that has equations on. I promise there are only three equations total in the talk. I've tried to keep it as short as possible on the, on the map. You love equations. You love equations. <laughs> That's great. I love equations, personally. I love equations. I love them. They're beautiful. Um, and we don't actually need to understand the content of these equations to understand what they say. Um, but this is an equation which relates the energy of radiation to its wavelength. The wavelength is given by the character on the far right of the equation, which looks like a V, but it's actually a Greek letter nu. And uh, this H that you see here, that's just a constant, just a number. So it doesn't vary. But this equation shows us that energy goes up when the wavelength of light goes up. So in other words, if the way, uh, I'm sorry, I've been saying the wrong term. <laughs> nu is not the wavelength, nu is the frequency, sorry. So we'll talk about wavelength in a moment. So nu is the frequency of light and E is the energy. So as the energy goes up, the frequency goes up. So the energy, you can measure energy and characterize it in any unit you like, but it's important to understand why energy goes up with frequency. And the reason is because if you treat light, if you think of light as a sort of stream of particles and each particle is like a little packet of energy, then the more particles that are arriving, the more energy that's arriving. But if the frequency is lower and there are fewer particles arriving and each is imparting a little bit of energy, then you're receiving less energy. So energy corresponds to frequency and frequency is also related to wavelength. So how does this pertain to web? Well, web is an entirely infrared instrument as the, the meme hints. Web doesn't actually see visible light at all. It's mostly, it does see a little part of the red spectrum, but you can see that it's uh, wavelength range, which is given at the bottom here in nanometers NM, 
ranges from 600 to 28,500. Uh, for convenience, we tend to scale from nanometers to micrometers, millionths of a meter. So we would say that's 0 0.6 up to 28 and a half microns or micrometers. Um, but numbers aside, Web is designed to look at what we call the near and the mid infrared. On the left, you can see the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope's wavelength range went from 90 nanometers up to 2.5 microns. So the Hubble Space Telescope could see a little bit of the near infrared, and it could see a little bit of the ultraviolet, but it was its response was centered around the visible part of the spectrum, which the number isn't shown here, but the visible part of the spectrum has a range of around 400 nanometers, which is the violet, up to around 700 nanometers, which is very deep red, where it basically crosses over to the infrared. And then on the right here is a space telescope that I have a little bit of history with, the Spitzer Space Telescope. I used data from Spitzer in my undergrad dissertation. And the Spitzer Space Telescope is a far infrared telescope. So this is another infrared instrument. And it comes after Hubble and before JWST. Spitzer was launched in 2003. And the Spitzer Space Telescope, as you can see, looks at around three microns. Um, all the way up to 160 microns. So this is kind of a, a different beast altogether. And the JWST is not a replacement to Spitzer or to Hubble, but more of a complement. It is nevertheless an improvement in terms of design and size and power, but it's not necessarily a replacement. And where Spitzer and JWST overlap, there's a lot to be learned because the Spitzer Space Telescope has been observing the sky for almost 20 years. It, it has a run out of uh, coolant, which means it uh, can only observe in certain wavelengths now. But um, it's nevertheless observed so many objects in the sky that it's been able to throw up a list of really interesting targets that JWST can prioritize its time on um, to look deeper and with more resolution. And is this the whole reason why the 50 Kelvin is so important? Yes. So. Exactly. Yes. Thank you for reminding me of that as well. So these infrared telescopes have to keep themselves extremely cool because if you think about it, the sun is such an intense infrared source. In fact, there are so many infrared sources, but crucially, the telescope itself can easily become an infrared source because mm -hmm. the telescope can absorb radiation from the sun and that radiation can be re-emitted inside the telescope systems, inside its optical tube. And so the telescope can basically become warm enough to glow in the infrared and see itself which spoils the the images. It's a, a little bit similar when you think about how, I don't know if you've ever done this, but years ago, I've developed a few photographs in a dark room and dark rooms are illuminated with red light only because the red light has so little energy relative to the other colors of light that your, your photographs won't basically overexpose in the bath. They won't be exposed to too much energy and, and basically heat up and, uh, and become too bright. So, the reason that Webb improves on the design of previous generations of infrared telescopes, and indeed on optical telescopes like Hubble, well, it has to do with its enormous size, the, the huge size of that primary mirror. There's an equation that astronomers use, and it's kind of a first approximation. There are some caveats, but this is pretty helpful, um, which relates the resolution of a telescope to its, to its diameter, and it's related to the wavelength of light. So this equation on the left, we have theta, and theta here is the angular resolution of, let's say, two stars close to each other in the sky. And what this equation is telling us is that for a specific wavelength, which is lambda, we need a specific diameter of telescope D in order to achieve the resolution, spatial resolution to separate those two stars as different sources. So if we're observing with a, with a fixed size of telescope, if we change the wavelength we look at, we can change the effective resolution of the telescope. If we look at a star, or let's say a pair of stars in the ultraviolet, we're more likely to be able to resolve them than if we look at them in the infrared. And, and that this, means- I, hmm. I was just gonna say, is this the same thing like, um, you know, in photography, when you have like a big telephoto lens to, to, to shoot, you know, wildlife or celebrities, whatever, at a, at a far distance away, you know, like that, that's the same thing that's going on, right? Like we, there, you, we can't like just enhance infinitely. We're limited by the photons and yeah. we physically need to capture those, you know, more. Yes. So every, every photographic lens is just, yeah, it's just equivalent to a telescope. 
Um, if it's a prime lens, it has just like a telescope, it has some fixed characteristics. And yes, its resolution is determined by the aperture, the, the aperture diameter, and uh, it is the front element that determines the maximum aperture. So with a telescope, uh, with a camera lens, it is the first piece of glass that the light enters is that can be considered the diameter of the lens. But we actually do alter the aperture of camera lenses at the back as well in order to let in more or less light and to achieve uh, different depth of field effects. Uh, whereas with a telescope like, like Webb or Hubble or Spitzer, they would always have a fixed uh, focal length and a fixed aperture and it wouldn't it would never be altered but what they can do is observe in multiple wavelengths so this equation is basically just a way of showing us that as the wavelength of a of a, of a source goes up if we're looking in longer wavelengths like the infrared then we are going to have a lower spatial resolution and just to be clear the wavelength is uh, is the inverse if you like of the frequency it's related by the speed of light which is C so um, we can find the frequency of any wave for which we know its wavelength or vice versa using a constant. And that just means that uh, as the frequency increases, the wavelength gets lower, the resolution gets higher. As the frequency decreases, as it does with infrared light, the wavelength gets longer, the resolution gets lower. So to compensate for that, that lowering of resolution in the infrared, we need to make D here on this equation larger. And in order to do that, we build a bigger mirror. So you've probably seen some, some image comparisons like this and just illustrating the scale of these mirrors. You know, Hubble is a big telescope. If you ever go to, um, to Kennedy Space Center, to the visitor center, you can stand under a full scale replica of the Hubble telescope and it is huge. It is like a bus, it's massive. It has a 2.4 meter wide mirror. And at the time in 1990, it was unprecedented. It's not the largest uh, single mirror telescope ever launched. That honor goes to Herschel with a 3.6 meter mirror. But Herschel was also a far infrared telescope rather like Spitzer. And you can see Spitzer actually has quite a small mirror, especially for its long wavelength observation of just 0.85 meters. Meanwhile, Webb just completely dwarfs them with this 6.5 meter mirror. So Webb provides unprecedented resolution for its particular area of expertise, which is the infrared. And the infrared is very sensitive to resolution because it's, it's long wavelength observations. So compared to previous generations of, uh, of infrared observatories, Webb just knocks it out of the park. It's, it's way ahead. Um, Spitzer uh, at a comparative wavelength here of 8.6 microns to 7.7, .7, you know, it's, it's blobby. Um, WISE is the Wide Infrared Survey Explorer. May have got that wrong, but WISE was more like an all sky instrument or uh, basically took very, very large regions of the sky. So spatial resolution wasn't its main goal. But uh, Spitzer was for a long time the sort of leader in infrared astronomy, and it was one of NASA's cornerstone space telescopes. And as you can see, Webb, with its mid infrared instrument here, Miri, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a mo, it's absolutely crushing it. And it's revealing all of these stars, these point sources in the background that are just invisible in the other images because they fall below that criterion. They are basically smaller than the theta for that particular instrument, and they cannot be resolved as individual sources. They just blur into the into to the uh, the sort of the the overall signal pattern across the image. So Webb has a, a series of instruments. Um, these instruments can be filtered to capture light in lots of different wavelengths, and those individual wavelengths can then be combined to produce images. But the cameras that produce the pictures that we see. There are really just two that are used to make those images. One is near cam, so the, it's the near infrared camera, and the other is MIRI, the mid infrared instrument. And then there is another instrument that is um, quite important to recognize in terms of the initial results and probably some of the most exciting stuff, and that's NIRIS, which is the near infrared imaging slitless spectrograph. I think that's what it stands for, near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, most likely. And you can see that near cam basically focuses on the on the infrared wavelengths that are closest to the visible spectrum. So they're going to have the highest resolution. And MIRI focuses on those longer wavelength, uh, sort of mid infrared. So they're going to have lower resolution. And here we can see what that actually looks like side by side. This is one of the first images that came out um, the day after Joe Biden sort of fumbled his way through, we got a proper briefing with some extra images. Um, it was very exciting and it was presented by scientists working on web. It was fun. It was really fantastic, actually very exciting to watch. Um, and I was doing like a news item at the time. So I was like watching all this happen on Twitter, on my phone and chewing all my 5g just to stream it in a taxi. 
Um, and you can see on the left an image here from Miri, uh, excuse me, from NearCam, and on the right is an image from Miri. These are both images of the Southern Ring Nebula, which is about 2,000 light years away. And this is called a planetary nebula, not because it uh, has any planets in it or is a planet, but uh, it's just sort of an old fashioned name. Um, the first astronomers to see these kinds of nebulae in the sky, they sort of thought they looked a bit like planets and that's where the name comes from. But these are actually the, the outflows of dying stars. So here we can see a star basically throwing away its atmosphere. Uh, the sun is destined to become something like this in a few billion years time. And uh, so, alien astronomers in billions of years will probably see our solar system the way that we see this nebula today. And uh, this whole structure, by the way, is about a half a light year across. So it's much, much vastly bigger than the, the part of the solar system that the planets occupy here in our solar system. So the image on the left shows us this amazing detail, this uh, fine structure in the, the gas that's, that's flowing away. Um, and the image on the right doesn't have that same crisp resolution, but it has its own merits. The image on the right actually was used to show for the first time that the star in the heart of this nebula is itself surrounded by quite a dense envelope of gas and dust. And so there's some physical process that's happening during the death of this star, which is happening over a relatively short time scale, quite recently even, that isn't particularly well understood. So in those terms, Webb is basically showing us something that's never been seen before. And it's not to say it was unexpected, but it, it certainly throws up a bunch of questions that, that are going to need to be answered and, and that are going to take a lot of research to answer. So this is pretty exciting for an image that was essentially designed to show off the capabilities of the telescope, but already has research implications. This, this image also makes me um, think of another question that I had, which is, yeah. you talked about how um, the um all of all of the photons that this this device is capturing are in the infrared spectrum we see light in the visible spectrum so when we're looking at the pixels on our screen right now they have been converted into wavelengths that we can see and all of these beautiful colors are not what the instrument was originally seeing so how does that colorization process work yeah 100 percent. we are not seeing none of the light in this image is visible and we would never be able to see this no matter how large a telescope we built we could never look at this with our eyes in this way we can see it in in the visible spectrum as well but the infrared reveals so much more in terms of the structure so that's a really good question and the answer is it kind of depends on the observatory different observatories tend to have a different what we call a palette and they will take a certain range of wavelengths from the from the camera and they will assign one to red one to green one to blue put them into photoshop and then just screen those layers on top of one another it's a little bit more sophisticated but frankly it's you can do it your, yourself that way and get a basically the same result so um you would create a palette and you would assign wavelengths to be those three colors so infrared images have this really alien appearance to them they look so strange but the, usually the colors are selected in such a way as to draw attention to details which show a lot of contrast. So the image on the left, for example, um, the blue in that image is, as with the real uh, visible spectrum that we see, uh, this is real by the way, but as with the visible spectrum, the blue infrared light we see here, or the infrared light that's been assigned the blue channel in the image is hotter. So it's showing us higher energy infrared. And we can see that that's mostly focused around the kind of uh, the core of this nebula, which is, uh, the nebula is really three, three dimensional. It's not flat and it really is kind of coming towards us as much as it's going out sideways, but we can see um, a sort of cavity in the center and that cavity is hotter where the dying star is energizing that gas and the energy perhaps is not able to escape um, as efficiently. And meanwhile, the gas around it, which looks more red is cooler. But in the image on the right, which is the mid infrared image, the mirror image, well, it may be that they flip that around or perhaps it's the same but all of the wavelengths used to make the mirror image are not the same as any of the wavelengths used to make the near cam image so again they've assigned a similar sort of palette here and i suspect this is actually a bichromatic so they've just assigned red blue it's hard to mm -hmm. say exactly but um in the case of hubble which could see seven uh which was typically had a palette made of up to seven wavelengths in the visible part of the spectrum, it could be quite a complicated process. Some of those images, they would take these seven different wavelengths and they'd have like one that's like pink, one that's brown, one that's sort of just a little bit green, one that's a little turquoise, one that's red, one that's dark red. And when you assign them all together, you would basically get enough information to build a kind of three channel RGB image at the end of the day that was relatively balanced. 
So it really just depends on the observatory, but there have we have seen some overlap in the sort of general color profile of web images and Hubble images. And I think that's because STSCI, the Space, space Science, sorry, the Space Telescope Science Institute in the US, they operate both telescopes and their image processors are working on these images. So I have a feeling that this palette is, is here to stay. That's um, more complicated than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like, oh, we just divide by 10 and that puts it in, that knocks the oh. wavelengths down to the visible spectrum and then we can see it. Oh, if only it were so simple, that would actually, be, <laughs> that would be really handy. But I do recommend when an image comes out from the Webb telescope, it's actually worth going over to uh, the European Space Agency's web site, which is esaweb.org, uh, all one word, esaweb, because there's always a really good technical description of how the image is made at the ESA mm -hmm. website. And, and if you delve deep enough, you can find the wavelengths that were imaged. And those wavelengths are usually given, the, sometimes they're written in a rather obscure fashion, like it might just be like a, a letter followed by four numbers. But the four numbers usually do correspond to the wavelength in, in nanometers, might be five numbers in this case. Um, and the, the letter usually corresponds to the, uh, well, it, it may correspond to a filter um, in the telescope, or it may just correspond to the camera. So usually the filters have letters and numbers assigned to them. And if you look at the technical description of web, which is publicly available, you can actually see all the different filters on each camera. And there are there are vast numbers of, of filters. These filters are what we call narrow band filters. So they isolate quite specific wavelengths of light. And that just means that if there's some specific process happening, like you know a star kicks off radiation and it interacts with a planet's atmosphere in a particular way, they know that in order to discover that atmosphere or, or profile that atmosphere, they're going to need to look for that specific physical interaction. So they'll use that very narrow wavelength of light to image it um, and they'll select a filter. So those filters have been designed by the, uh, the James Webb Consortium to be as scientifically interesting and hopefully useful as possible. And if you were to bid for time on the web and do your own images, you would have to select which filters you want to image in and for how long um, in order to make these kinds of images. Cool. So this is a this we, we can see as well again how this resolution um, can be exploited, but how the MIRI instrument, which has a lower resolution, is so powerful. This is another image that was released in the in the first images from Webb, and it shows um, a cluster of galaxies called Stefan's Quintet. We're only actually seeing four of them here because I've kind of cropped one of them off the bottom. Um, and not all of these galaxies are the same distance from us, um, but four out of the five are about 300 million light years away, and they are physically interacting with one another. So when galaxies physically interact, they disrupt each other. They, the mutual gravity and also this uh, substance we call dark matter, which we believe surrounds these galaxies, it's gravitationally interacting with the stars inside the galaxy. It's causing them to become tidally disrupted, lose their shape, and all kinds of exciting and amazing things happen when galaxies fly by each other or crash into each other. So Stefan's Quintet is particularly complicated. So here we see a near cam image. So this again is this is the near infrared. So none of this is visible light, but this is uh, sort of looks evocative like a Hubble image. You know, it looks like a galaxy might look, you know, mostly blue because the bright stars are mostly blue. But what happens when I overlay the, the other data from Miri on top is that we can, for any given target, we can, we can look at stars with near cam with a good spatial resolution, but we can look at the dust and gas that the stars are made of and that surrounds those stars using Miri. This is not always true, but in the general sense, particularly when looking at galaxies, near cam and Miri pretty much are showing us stars and gas pretty much separately. And that means that we can see the interactions that are occurring on different parts of the galaxy structure. So when we actually look at the composite and we add the MIRI data, the near cam image ends up looking like this. And it is drastically more interesting for galaxy uh, studying astronomers, for those who study the physics of galaxies, the astrophysics of galaxies. It, this is, again, it's unprecedented. We've never seen this at this kind of resolution before and actually my uh, display here isn't doing it justice. This is an ultra high resolution mosaic and I recommend downloading it and just uh, zooming in and looking around. You can see star clusters uh, all the way through these galaxies as little uh, little blobs of light. And you can see here that these galaxies are, are feeding each other gas and dust. You can see flows of gas and dust here revealed by Miri, which are glowing in the, in the mid infrared because that's how the gas interacts with the starlight. And it's giving us so much more information about the structure of these galaxies and how they're affecting each other. 
And that's going to help us to understand the masses of these galaxies, which is going to help us to understand the distribution of stuff like dark matter in the universe. So there are quite a lot of ancillary findings to be had from looking for one specific type of uh, interaction. So um, that's, a, that's a really nice one. Again, just a comparison here showing you, you know, what, what we see in the mid-infrared and what we don't see in the near-infrared and how important it is to be able to study these uh, composites. And again, when the two are combined, the palette becomes more complicated. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the astronomers tune the palette so that the stars come out at a good range of, of orange to blue, because stars in the sky really are orange through to blue, uh, depending on their temperature. And so I suspect that they tune the palette so that the stars come out natural. If they did something weird with the palette and we had a lot of green stars in the final image, like we do in Spitzer, um, it would look a bit too esoteric. Um, and a bit too obtuse for most of the public to be able to understand what they were seeing. So this is probably part of what's inspired this palette. And it is pretty, you know, it looks fiery, but just remember the the, the red stuff that we see in this picture, uh, that gas, um, that's actually cooler. It's less energetic than the stars. It's actually cooler, but it is it is still glowing with infrared energy. And here, just for comparison, this is the same field of view, but this is the field just with the data from MIRI. So there's no near cam data at all. And this uses a completely different palette, which is very strange looking. It does have green in it. And there is nothing green in space except like comets tails. So it's, it's not really natural at all the way this has been processed. But by taking different wavelengths just from that one camera and assigning them to different color channels, very subtle contrast can be revealed here, showing us that these different gases in these different galaxies are shining with different amounts of energy. They are different temperatures and where they crash into each other, they might be hotter or where there is a higher density of stars, like on the galaxy on the left there, they might be hotter. So again, really interesting information that you can kind of taste just by looking at the picture, but astronomers generally are trying to find this balance between something that's very beautiful, which the public will find engaging, but then something which is scientifically very exciting. Uh, very recently, this is just for com uh, for completion, we saw this, uh, this image revealed as well. This is the Cartwheel Galaxy. Um, so this is actually one of the most distant targets that's been imaged in detail by Webb. It's about half a billion light years away, and the detail is absolutely mind-blowing. And again, what I love about this image is that we've got this wonderful separation between this pink-like pink material, which is the neutral gas and dust. This is the kind of gas and dust that stars are born out of, but it's also the kind of gas and dust that gets shrugged off by dying stars. But then we can see stars at, at, in a more sort of average stage of their life. They're the sort of blue sprinkle behind from near cam. And um, this galaxy has this wonderfully complex uh, structure with the core having its own kind of halo of gas and also a sort of ring all the way around the edge. So again, this image just reveals the dynamics of the galaxy in a new light um, and with extraordinary resolution that's never been achieved before. And this really is just the beginning. And another lovely thing about this image is all these little orange points you see in the background are distant background galaxies. And many of those were simply invisible to previous generations of telescopes that weren't able to resolve them. So when Webb starts to scoop up more of the sky with this level of depth, we're going to start to get a much grander view of the universe. But the image that captured most people's attention, I think, was this one, which also had a very evocative title. It's called Cosmic Cliffs. And this is a part of the Carina Nebula, which I think is about eight and a half thousand light years away. Don't quote me on that in case I'm wrong. But uh, Cosmic Cliffs is, is a beautiful image. Um, again, I think the palette, they've, they've chosen it so they get a nice balance of star colors. So you can see golden stars and blue stars, which looks very natural, uh, just like we remember seeing from Hubble. Um, and actually, Hubble has taken an image of this same region of the sky, but again, Webb just beats it on resolution and detail because with Webb's infrared eye, we're able to peer through this gas and dust, and we're able to see stars that are cocooned in the gas and dust, whose infrared light is able to get out, but whose higher uh, energy and shorter wavelength light are generally absorbed by that gas and dust. So this is showing us far more stars in the Carina Nebula than have ever been seen before. And if we look at a composite from the data from MIRI, we also get to see sort of strange structures like outflows from stars, and we see how those structures are, uh, are influencing the gas around it as well. And actually, MIRI is looking at such a long wavelength that it peers 
it peers so well through the through the curtain of gas that the curtain of gas itself just starts to look kind of semi-transparent because uh, the mirror instrument is able to see all of these stars behind it and um, turn something that's otherwise completely opaque into a kind of ghostly apparition. So finding more stars in the galaxy and finding stars that are engulfed in gas and dust and young stars in particular, that is one of the pillars of Webb's science goals. And that's something that it's extremely well designed to do. But there were also some surprises from those first images, which um, you know we did not. I personally didn't expect these to come out, and uh, they just kind of speak again to the sort of you know the grab and go raw um, way that astronomy is done. Sometimes this is a, an image of Jupiter with one of its moons. I think it might be um, Io or Europa, uh, one of the innermost moons there, and I think you can see the shadow of that moon being cast onto Jupiter as well in the lower right. And this is Jupiter glowing in the infrared, and it's not the greatest image of Jupiter, but this again was kind of a test image. I, I've come to understand um, from sort of calibrating the sensors and, and testing the infrared sensitivity, and the image itself is not beautiful, but it's giving us a very good indication of the bright future ahead for Webb in terms of imaging uh, objects in our own solar system. I don't think we're going to see a huge amount of work on our own solar system from Webb. Um, it will make it a small fraction of what astronomers choose to do with the telescope because it doesn't offer as many advantages in that arena over existing missions. Um, but again, that was just kind of a nice surprise. And then finally, oh, not finally. No, finally, I'll come to something finally. Before that, penultimately, I have a plug, which is that if you want to view Jupiter yourself, then I've written a book all about observing the solar system. And it's coming out on the 1st of September, so very soon. And you can pre-order it now. So there you go. You can't quite see it with the clarity that Webb does, but you can get a very nice view. Speaking of solar systems, though, we got some images from Webb that I think did go under the radar because they didn't have that beautiful um, eye-watering appeal that the, the cosmic cliffs and the and Stefan's quintet had. Um, and that's because these are not images. These are graphics, and they are created from data coming from, you can see in the top right, NIRISS, the Near Infrared Imager and uh, Slitless Spectrograph. So this is a device which doesn't take images. It's not what we call a photometer. It doesn't uh, doesn't turn light into into signals on on, a, on pixels on a camera. This is something that actually looks at different wavelengths of light and measures their intensity. And Webb was pointed at a known transiting exoplanet, WASP 96b, which is about 1,100 light years away from the Earth, uh, which passes in front of its star every three and a half days or so. It's a gas giant planet about half as massive as Jupiter, so and it has quite a large envelope of gas around it. So when it passes in front of its star, this planet is able to block out a measurable amount of the star's light. It is minuscule, as you can see from the scale of the graph. It goes down to just under uh, 99, it goes down to about 98.5%. So about 1.5% of the star's light is blocked. But the slit the spectrograph on Webb provided a beautiful, super coherent light curve here just showing that during the transit of that planet, a transit that takes a couple of hours to complete, you can see how the star's light dips, reaches its bottom as the uh, as the greatest eclipse or greatest occultation of that planet occurs. And then as the planet starts to egress from the disk of that star, we see the light value come back again. Now we can't take a picture, we can't image that planet, we can't see that star as a disk, we just see it as a point of light. But by, by measuring how the light dips, we can see that transit. And this is nothing new, but Webb does it with superb precision i mean really impressive but, and i you know, guess what's, what's cool about this is that with this level of precision like imagine the dip was like um like what's the scale net and uh, like more one percent ish on the 99 line like let's imagine that it was a 50th of that that it was just barely eking below that one 100 percent line you could still detect that the, the the like the signal to noise ratio on this diagram is incredible it's really impressive, really impressive. And and again, as you say, you're absolutely right. If it was if it was just a tiny fraction of that, then you could still detect it. And the implications for that are a small planet like the Earth would make a tiny dip. A small planet like Mercury would make a tiny dip. And of course, those rocky terrestrial type planets, they're really exciting to astronomers and I think to everybody who who thinks about the possibility of habitability or extraterrestrial life. So being able to yeah detect those Earth-like planets, that is something that Webb can do. But there's more, there's more to it. But wait, there's more? But wait, there's more. <laughs> so earlier, we talked about how infrared light is easily absorbed by our bodies. And one of the reasons that we absorb infrared light 
so well is because our bodies are made of a large quantity of water. Now, the atmosphere also contains water vapor. And for that reason, infrared astronomy is quite difficult to do from the ground. So in the 1830s, when astronomers started to try and do infrared observations, you know, it was a struggle because not a lot of infrared light from space reaches the Earth's surface. Most of it is absorbed by water vapor in the atmosphere. Now, to get around that problem, astronomers put their infrared observatories at high altitude. There's there's UKIRT, the U, the uh, UK Infrared Telescope in Hawaii, which I've I, I've had the pleasure to go and sit next to. It's very high altitude. It's on the top of a, of a volcano and it's above the clouds. SOFIA, which is a, a 747 jumbo jet with a telescope in the side of it, which is just about to be decommissioned, very sadly, but it has done many years of good work. It flies up into you know into the into the to the air to the height of a 747, 40,000 feet or so, and points a telescope at space. And at, at that level, the atmosphere is much more tenuous and there's less infrared absorption. Then, of course, we have WISE, we have Spitzer, we have the very first infrared satellites like IRAS in the 80s, and we have Herschel, and now we have Webb. And these instruments are in space and they don't have to contend with the Earth's atmosphere. But the fact that water absorbs infrared light is very interesting because when a planet passes in front of its star like this, if we know what the spectrum of the starlight coming to us is before the transit and we measure the spectrum during the transit, we can see which gases in the planet's atmosphere are absorbing light. So we can profile the gases, which is what Webb did. And Webb Ooh. found for the first time in extraordinary detail, very, very, very strong, conclusive really, as far as astronomers are concerned, presence of water in the atmosphere of WASP-96b because now Webb is looking at the individual wavelengths of light and it's looking at the, um, the absorption, that's the amount of light that's actually blocked in each wavelength. Yeah. And it's finding that during the transit, more of the colors of light that correspond to water absorption are being blocked, which means water is present in that exoplanet atmosphere. So this is where the power of Webb is going to make headlines, but without the visuals necessarily. It's going to be studying exoplanets, which is a major component of its mission design. Um, to profile them for potential habitability. And I dare say, you know, this is again, it's kind of one of those predictions that you put your reputation on the line. But if, um, if there are habitable Earth-like planets out there, planets like the Earth but, and with abundant water, meaning that they have atmospheres that pressurize water, which means they're probably very temperate like the Earth, then Webb will be able to find them and to highlight them and to, to point the way to the most interesting targets and to probably quite definitively tell us um, what their atmospheres are actually like. And there are numerous assumptions we can make about how life affects the atmosphere of a planet. But let's put it this way, if life is out there, then telescopes like Webb, as well as the next generation of ground-based telescopes and other exoplanet hunting instruments that are being launched quite soon, they are going to be able to pretty much prove it as much as you can prove anything at that kind of distance within the next 10 to 15 years. Webb will play an, a crucial role because Webb's mission is being uh, effectively extended. Webb was nominally designed to, to work for at least five years, but uh, the launch from that sexy Ariane 5 was so efficient that Webb has enough fuel to go well past the year 2030 which means we're going to get a more than probably more than a decade of science out of the telescope. And um, that's a lot more than than the astronomers probably even hoped for initially. They probably would have hoped to get six to eight years, more than 10 years. It's amazing. So we can expect a lot of interesting results, especially late stage results, as astronomers find more and more planets like this, but rocky ones, which warrant this level of investigation. And I think that is my last slide. So it's ex it's an exciting time. Webb is basically an infrared pioneer. It builds upon decades of research into infrared space-based astronomy. Um, it is essentially a perfect machine for its size and scale. And the early results have been so promising. Um, it is gonna be making headlines throughout the year, every year going forward. And rather like Hubble, it's probably gonna become a sort of household name, dare I say, almost a boring word. It's probably gonna be used in, in crap sci-fi films as a throwaway term for years to come. But crucially, while the images are not what we see with our eyes, and that's something we should have as a caveat, I just think crucially, the data that's gonna come from this telescope, it, it's very likely to surprise 
the uh, the average person, even space enthusiasts. And so if you're curious about astronomy, then you're in for a very bright 10 years ahead because we're going to be seeing basically more and more exciting stuff as time goes by in pretty much the most exciting areas of astronomy, the cosmic history of the universe, the evolution of galaxies, including our own Milky Way, how young stars form and how young solar systems form around them. And then finally, exoplanets, habitability, the search for life. Those are the pillars of Webb's exploration. So I think I will, I will come away from that and go back to full screen camera. And then, um, you know, if anybody has any questions um, that uh, they'd like to pick up on or any corrections, then let's let's do it. I think Sam's been keeping a list of the questions that have been coming up in chat. Um, uh, yes, yeah, and I've been knocking them off as as uh, Tom ends up answering them. Yes, so, yes I think you've uh, answered most the one, of the ones. The one, the one that I had queued up was, well, what does this mean for us? And then Tom sort of hit the nail on the head there um, with his with his sum up. Um, yeah, I had one. Sorry, well, we had a uh, I had a question that came through on uh, Instagram asking about you know what the likelihood is that we'll see something new, and I think you you covered that that we're already seeing things new, and so yeah, that's yeah the likelihood that we'll see something new. Yeah, and and again, you know, we're talking about um, we're talking about what it means for something to be new, for something to be unseen, um, because it's not necessarily a well defined term in astronomy. But uh, in terms of seeing something unexpected, I think the likelihood of seeing something unexpected is basically 100%. Uh, in fact, we've, we're pretty much already there with looking at the core of the Southern Ring Nebula and finding that there are interesting physics happening. Again, I think astronomers would have expected that there was more going on in these nebulae than initially met the eye. But just finding out that there are these short time scale processes that are occurring that we can finally see, you know, it's like, it's like looking it's like looking at the individual breaths of a, of a dying person. You know, it's a bit morbid, but for, a, for <laughs> somebody who works in medicine, that would probably be very exciting. Um, and so finally being able to see the sort of final throes of a dying star it, at a, such a small temporal resolution, things that might occur over, over a period of a year or a decade, that's really exciting. Um, so Webb is kind of already there. I mean, and, and I will say on behalf of astronomers, everywhere that I know, Webb has exceeded expectations already. It's already exceeded expectations. It's, it's basically already proven itself to be worth the weight and worth the cost, which were both of which were high, by the way. Um, and so maybe, maybe to ask the slightly pessimistic question, well, what could go wrong now? What, what could stop us from, from yeah, um, so you probably saw on the news that Webb was struck by a micrometeoroid um, on one of its mirror segments, which uh, which happens to all telescopes in space. It happens to the International Space Station, which has cracks in its windows, would you believe? Um, stuff in space is designed to be struck by other things in space. There's a ton of, it's a shooting gallery. There's a ton of little things out there. So scientists were quite stressed when Webb took a, took a hit so soon because um, we think we have a reasonable idea of how dense the the space around L2 and the other Lagrange points are. And based on that, you know, astronomers expected that Webb might be struck a few times in its lifetime, but, uh, you know, surely not right away. But of course, you know, it's, 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 it's as likely to happen anytime. So um, the fact that it was struck so soon is, is a cause of stress. And there were a lot of clickbait headlines. But uh, people I know who work on Webb are not not concerned about that it's they're actually more interested in it than they are worried um, they don't expect it to happen again you know right away and the telescope is designed for that there are contingencies for how the mirror segments can be balanced so that um, over time if mirror segments are no longer usable they can be shut down and it will make a, a small adjustment to the performance of the telescope but it would still it would still be the most powerful thing in the sky by a long way so um so there are contingency plans there are other um, spacecraft subsystems that can fail so it's possible for telescopes to fail for all, all manner of reasons, but there are redundant systems in telescopes as well. So Webb, for example, points itself using, using these spinning wheels that are inside it. And those spinning wheels, which are called reaction wheels, are designed to alter the angular momentum of the telescope so it can point and track the stars very precisely. Hubble has similar wheels and they will always have redundant wheels. So if one or two of those wheels fail, the pointing accuracy isn't, uh, isn't affected. 
Um, and there are other redundant subsystems as well on the spacecraft, like lots and lots of them. So I don't anticipate anything going terribly wrong. It's designed to resist the you know intense solar flares. It's designed to uh, keep itself at a, a very good operating temperature. Its pointing accuracy is is exceeding expectations. So at this stage, I'm, I'm not really concerned about it. But of course, there are always unforeseen things. It's just most of them involve physical objects that are too small and dark to be seen plummeting into the telescope. And uh, astronomers do have good models for the likelihood of that happening. And fortunately, even though the solar system is a shooting gallery, it do really doesn't happen very often. And when it does, it's, it's, it's something the size of a grain of dust. It just has a lot of energy when it strikes because it's moving very fast. Cool. cool. Um, and I mean, I could, I'll, I'll just keep going through these until you tell me to stop. Yeah. Um, so you um, showed us, you know, how it's identifying exoplanets. And I suppose certainly from my own my own understanding, actually, the, the larger gas giants are the easy ones to find. And then the smaller rocky planets are harder to find. And they're often also further out. And so, you know, and smaller. What about rogue planets? Is that something mm -hmm. you to have a bash at or? Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I didn't really touch too much on the on the the real benefits of the infrared. So we talked about how infrared is a low a low energy radiation compared with visible light or UV or X-rays or something like that. So infrared objects are generally considered to be quite cold objects and the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars are cold. If a planet goes rogue and it's ejected from its solar system and it goes out among the stars, it will be an ultra cool source, very, very cold indeed. But as long as it's warmer than 50 Kelvin, um, a web stands a chance of being able to detect it. And um, for that reason, the study of rogue planets, I think, is probably is probably on the list somewhere for some astronomers that have bid for time on the Webb telescope. But the problem with rogue planets is if you want to observe them, you need to first find them. And, um, you know, as you kind of identified, finding small planets is uh, is tricky. Um, if they're further out, their orbits take longer. If a planet is Earth-like and it orbits a Sun-like star, you're only going to see one dip every year or so. So you need to be scanning that planet for like three years to observe two dips to be confident there's a planet there. And Webb does not have the time to waste looking at one particular star for three years. So those kinds of discoveries are usually left to survey telescopes. So the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Science Satellite or Survey Satellite TESS uh, that is scanning lots of nearby stars all the time. It's it's looking at basically lots of nearby stars across the entire sky every day. And so it's able to detect transits at a high rate. Um, and then what that telescope can do is it can provide really interesting targets for more, for more detailed study from a telescope like Webb. Because Webb has a very narrow field of view. It sees a very small part of the sky all the time. It's a, the, the focal length of the instrument is over 100 meters long. It's, in, it's an incredibly long telescope yeah. folded up using mirrors into a shorter package. So it sees a, a very small region of the sky um, relative to something like uh, even Hubble sees, sees a wider, wide, wider region in its, in its own single camera because it's a shorter telescope. But um, yeah, relative to something like TESS, or even Kepler. Kepler was a telescope that studied uh, it studied for about six years or so, I believe. Actually, it was closer to eight years, I think. It was studying just one region of the sky in the constellation Cygnus. It was looking at 100,000 stars constantly, and it found thousands of, of transiting worlds there, which are called Kepler objects of interest, or KOIs, that are being further, they're having further study. And now that Kepler's um, K1 mission has kind of come to an end because its pointing accuracy has eroded, it's now being used to look at objects at the on the sort of outer edges of our own solar system, Kuiper Belt objects, very, very distant, cold worlds like Pluto, but further away. So um, to answer your question with rogue planets, it's a case of if a rogue planet were to turn up in a survey and we had a good confidence that it was there, it would certainly be interesting for Webb to take a spectrographic observation of it. Because if that planet is going to be glowing under its own heat, if it's got a core uh, that's molten, for example, then if anything, it's going to be visible in the infrared, but completely dark in the visible part of the spectrum. So it would be for an infrared telescope to do that. Cool. Yeah. That's so I. I'm seeing comment comments. 121 yeah. comments. Yeah. Funny. So um, the, the <laughs> I've comments, just seen that now. Sorry. Yeah. Ninety percent. Uh, no, don't worry. Bit of, bit of a chat. Um, so 
and I think we touched on this in the in the first um, video that you did, but uh, L2. Is it stable? When you say it's orbiting around L2, what do you mean by mm -hmm. that? Yeah, L2 is like a point in space. There's nothing there, but you can you can basically um, you can create what's called a Lagrangian orbit. Uh, it's really strange to think about, but if you can imagine, hmm, how can I do this with props? I don't really have anything good. If you can just imagine like the sun and the Earth, and then Webb behind the Earth, um, in this there's a point where basically the gravity of the sun and the gravity of the Earth essentially kind of zero out the overall effect. It's gravity. like if you have like the rubber sheet model of gravity and like you've got like the sun is like a big bowling ball in the rubber sheet and like the the earth is like a, a baseball and and then like this is kind of like that that point where if you got a little marble it won't roll into either one yeah. is that the idea that's exactly it yeah, that's a really good way of visualizing it in your mind so yeah if there's a kind of disturbance from gravity from a source if you have numerous gravitational sources and you're close to a small one and there's a larger one further away you can find these points close to that small gravitational source, which in this case is the Earth, where essentially you don't feel, you don't feel the, the net effect of gravity at all. But the point, that point itself, it does move, it moves around the sun, and you can put yourself into orbit around it, but you do have to adjust that orbit over time. It's not stable over long periods. The orbit of the telescope is not stable over long periods. So Webb has a fuel budget, which is designed, it's called station keeping. It's designed to keep it um, in that particular kind of circular orbit. So from our perspective, Webb is kind of like tracing a spiral in the sky, um, but it's it's becoming more like a circle, and it's pretty much at the anti-solar point, like opposite the sun in the sky, but it's too faint, unfortunately, to, to photograph now. But it's out there just kind of going in a circle, and uh, I believe it takes about, um, I think it takes around six months to go all the way around once. So it's in a very long period, stable uh, Lagrangian type of orbit. St uh, the, the Lagrange point is stable uh, conceptually and physically, but the orbit does need to be adjusted. And, and so there is a certain amount of fuel. And it was the expectation was that Webb would need to cook some of that fuel in orbit in order to um, to kind of adjust its trajectory on the approach to L2. But because the, the Ariane 5 upper stage did such an efficient job and was so very sexy. precisely targeted because it's so damn sexy. <laughs> The telescope actually was able to get there without using much of its station keeping fuel. It, it used a tiny fraction of what was originally expected. And that's why its mission lifetime has basically doubled. You know, you, you got double your money's worth. Your $10 billion observatory just became worth like $20 billion of science from a single well-executed maneuver. So there's a lot to be said for really, really good launch operations and, and, um, and transfer operations. And credit has to go to Ariane Space because they did a brilliant, they did a fantastic job. It was it was really, really impressive. And I think it's won them an, a number of contracts or bidders for future launches. And they're now developing the Ariane 6, which is the, the next super heavy rocket to challenge, you know, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy and, and the Atlas 6 and other things like that. Cool. So um, another question that's, that's come up is um, how Oh, it says how far can James Webb see, but I think the, the better way of wording is how far back in time can it see? Yeah, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, um, it sort of depends on uh, on how far things are away, and that's something that we, we don't know for sure. But so what we what we do is we we look for something that's very distant. We uh, we don't measure how far away it is, but we measure a value called the redshift. So let's say, for example, we, we saw in that spectrographic plot that there were particular colors of light that were associated with the absorption of water, uh, absorption by water, I should say, of starlight. Now, all stars are made of hydrogen. So when light is emitted by a star, it passes through that star's own atmosphere. And by the time it exits the star, there'll be a kind of dark line uh, in, the in the light, particularly in the red part of the spectrum at about 656 nanometers where hydrogen absorbs um, so much light in the star's own atmosphere that it actually creates essentially a shadow in one specific wavelength called the hydrogen alpha absorption line. So when we look at the sun, we can measure that hydrogen alpha absorption line. It's 656 nanometers. But if the sun were moving away from us, which it does incidentally, because the Earth's distance from the sun changes, then the light that's emitted from the sun has that 656 nanometer shadow. But by the time the light reaches us from the sun, 
it's actually budged to a slightly higher value. It might be instead of 656.2, it might be 656.3 nanometers. Now we're talking about a fraction of a nanometer. It's very difficult to detect that unless you have a very precise spectrograph, which Webb has, and there are many very good ones on the ground as well. To give you an example of how precise these this kind of redshift spectroscopy can be, uh, we can detect um, the, the the relative motion of a star to a, to a speed of about one meter per second, which is about the speed of someone walking down the street. So when we look at stars in the sky, we can see them wobbling if they have planets going around them. We can actually see the planet's gravity displacing the star's position as the planet and the star pull on each other. And if that is greater than one meter per second, which it typically is for a large planet, then we can detect that. And um, future telescopes will get down to, uh, to a few centimeters per second. Very, very slow. You know, it's the speed of a small animal walking across the floor. So um, that's very precise. Now, going back to the question on how far we can see, we know that uh, the universe is expanding because when we look at distant galaxies, we see that redshift. And the, the farther away the galaxy appears, i.e. the smaller it looks, the greater the redshift is. So not only is the universe expanding, but it's expanding everywhere, such that something that's twice as far away from us is moving away from us twice as fast. So I mean, it's the space between all, all of us, us and the other galaxies, is all expanding everywhere at the same, the same rate, which is called the Hubble flow rate or Hubble flow. Um, and uh, that redshift is baked in because we know that the galaxies are made of stars. So the hydrogen alpha line, which is determined by quantum mechanics and the structure of the hydrogen atom, it's always 656 nanometers, but by the time that light reaches us from a distant source, it can have stretched several nanometers or tens of nanometers into the red. And if that source is very, very, very far away, you know, we're talking billions of light years as far as we can interpret it, then that line can be shifted so far. And indeed, all of the light coming from the star can be shifted so far that it basically becomes invisible to us invisible light all the visible light coming out of that star has been shifted over into the infrared and the star is now invisible but it's become a very hot infrared source and so an infrared detector is able to to see it as quite a bright source despite its great distance from us um, there are other factors like dust between galaxies absorbs infrared light as well and dust in our own galaxy absorbs infrared light but this principle this redshift um, which is just a dimensionless number it's just the speed uh, it's just the speed that some, it's like a ratio of the speed of a, of a distant source to the speed of light. So if your redshift is, is one, then it's traveling away from you at the speed of light. If your redshift is 0.5, then it's going at half the speed of light away from you. The most distant source in the universe is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So this isn't infrared light at all. This is microwave radiation. But it was, when it was emitted, it was very, very hot. It was like hotter than x-rays. It was like gamma rays and x-rays. And the expansion of the universe has stretched it out across such a vast amount of space that today its energy is so low that it, we receive it as microwave radiation. And the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, has a redshift of 1,000. So it is moving away. That, that, that horizon, which is visible to us as microwaves now, it is moving away from us at 1,000 times the speed of light. That's how we interpret that. So the universe is expanding very, very, very fast. The part of the universe that used to be the, the visible horizon is now receding at tremendous speed. But the, we, we detect things with redshifts greater than the speed of light all the time. And uh, Webb can see things with redshifts greater than the speed of light, indeed, uh, much, much faster. So there are galaxies that already have redshifts greater than one. And Re Webb is able to, to detect that um, because the light has departed on its way to us. And as the universe expands, you might think the light can't catch up to us, but that's not quite what's happening. The light is actually kind of stretching to fill the space it still travels at the same speed but it stretches to fill the space as it does so and that stretching increases its wavelength which reduces its frequency which reduces its energy makes it redder and redder infrared radio or infrared microwave radio for example so um i'm not giving you the best i can tell i'm sort of meandering around this answer but the so simple it's like as far back as it's possible to go the simple answer is yes that web can see web can see as far back as as any infrared source we expect to find in the universe now to be clear the cosmic microwave background radiation was emitted before there were any stars in the universe it was emitted very shortly after the big bang in cosmic terms about 379,000 years after the big bang and that's the point we interpret that as the point where the universe becomes basically transparent so for the first 379,000 years the universe was so dense there's so much matter flying around everywhere and radiation that uh, light just couldn't permeate through it. But when it becomes transparent, there's a kind of surface that everything bounces off. It's called the surface of last scattering. 
And that's the first light that is able to permeate through the universe. And we see that today as the cosmic microwave background. There's a big jump in time from 400,000 years to about 400 million years before stars start to emerge in the universe. And the first galaxies are born with those stars. And Webb has essentially already broken the distant re distance record because it has been able to see objects that are that are younger than 400 million years old. So it's already pushing back our understanding of the so-called dark ages of the universe when there were no stars and uh, showing us that the stars probably formed sooner than we previously believed. Um, and the universe's history is more complex. And indeed, we would expect it to be because the models are only as good as the, the data. So Webb is going to um, you know, improve this, the constraints on when those stars formed. So how far away are those stars now? Well, they're, they're, they're ridiculously far away. They're, um, they're at the boundary of our, um, our cosmic horizon virtually. Um, and that boundary is, is tens of billions of light years away from us in real terms. But there is something I should, there is a caveat, which is that converting redshift to light years requires a, a kind of model for the expansion of the universe. And we have a decent model, but in the future, that model might change and the scale factor that converts redshift to light years might change. So we might stop saying things are 5 billion light years away and we might start saying that now we think they're probably 6 billion because we were kind of converting the redshift wrong before and we've got some new information about that. So don't get too hung up on distances in light years because redshift is absolute and it's measurable, but distance is something we calculate from the redshift and that calculation is subject to to change. I don't think it will be completely overturned, but you might see variations and improvements and changes that correspond to a few percent or you know, who knows, maybe 10 percent one day. Dream big. So um, uh, it, it's small, it's small values, but it makes a big difference when you're when you're going billions of light years away. Cool. Luckily, we don't have to be that accurate because if all of this is all of this is wrong, no one even cares. Let's be honest. Well, that's, that's the thing about, they say about astronomy. Like you guys just basically work in orders of magnitude, right? Yeah, it's just a rounding error. Yeah. You know, what's a few hundred million light years between friends? Whatever. You know, it's just empty space anyway. Just round it up or down, however you like. Um, I mean, it's it's one of those things that you know, astronomers they 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 want the they want the exact answer, of course. Um, and Webb is going to give us so many so many exact answers that are very that are very woolly right now, which is again, it's just another thing that's really exciting. Um, I would just be wary that you will see a lot of clickbait around web it's so tempting now it, things have really changed so drastically i mean i remember when spitzer was launched it was i was doing my a levels i went to uni the following year i remember watching the spitzer launch on the internet um you know back broadband was pretty new at the time there was no youtube yet you only had uh, like nasa tv which was its own streaming service which was terrible and you were watching it in like 140p resolution but i remember watching the spitzer launch and thinking this is incredible and spitzer had a wonderful pr team that uh, helped to raise awareness of the telescope and they did they did great work with it and now here we are almost 20 years later and most of the world's kind of psycom is being is being fed through um, sources that prioritize grabbing your attention um, and so the kind of headlines now are very different than they used to be you didn't you just didn't get like headlines like spits are in trouble after micro meteorite hit. you didn't get headlines like that um it was all much more kind of let the scientists talk about what's happening but then again nobody was trying to get everyone's attention on the internet in those days because that wasn't how they made the money so just be wary of uh of clickbait that's that's all i'll say on that i do recommend going to the source because the european space agency and nasa and the canadian space agency they do their own press releases. They are superb. They are not obtuse. Anyone can read them. They're not written for scientists. They're written for everyone. And they're very clear. And you get straight from the source, straight from their scientists. And those press releases will always go through some kind of clickbait grinder by the time they reach you on your favorite uh, website that isn't a source. Cool. Um, and on that, 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 that note, I think we're going to going to wrap up we've gone over a little bit longer um on the subject of sexy rockets apparently the artemis rocket is currently being rolled out right now so oh my god tom wants to go, tom wants to go <laughs> off and watch that um oh, I'm but, getting a little yes. hot just thinking about it <laughs> the artemis um, yes. one thank you tom that was absolutely fascinating really interesting and you know fills me with excitement of what 
what more stuff we're going to learn and what more amazing images we're going to be seeing. Um, I'd like to give you a chance to tell people about yourself, you know, plug your book again. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an astronomer and author and, I've, and I, I founded my own, uh, sort of, uh, online learning platform called Stargazing London. Um, and I, I write books most of the time. That's most of what I'm doing right now. It's occupying a lot of time, but I quite like it. Um, so yeah, I've got a book coming out on the 1st of September, which is called Observing Our Solar System, A Beginner's Guide. So if you have a telescope or you're thinking about buying one and you're interested in seeing the planets and the moon, and there are some surprises in our solar system too, not just meteor showers, but other objects that you can see, then I think that will be of interest to you. It's available from HarperCollins on the 1st of September. Um, and next year, it's a little, this is, here's a, here's a scoop for Cambridge skeptics. This is absolutely the first time this has ever been said publicly. I am, uh, I'm writing a, the first two books in a series of graphic novels for a Collins imprint called Big Cat Books. So these books are sold to school libraries. They are, um, for primary school children. Um, but they are going to be a little bit hard sci-fi. I don't know how else to do. <laughs> I can't write something that isn't somewhat educational. So there will be a story there which has elements of things like Star Wars and Harry Potter and stuff like that. However, it is set in the solar system, all across the solar system in a couple of centuries from now. And there are people living on different worlds and moons and different uh, vistas and ways of carving out a living and lots of world building. So um, if you're like the expanse that, for kids. Um, like the expanse for kids. Oh that's a gosh. good way of putting it. I should have said. I should have told the publisher that's what it would be. You've sold me already. I'm so excited. The Expanse for Kids. I love that. That's great. And that's coming uh, in June of 2023. So it's a bit of a ways off, but uh, I will. Um, I will give Andrew the title when it's when it's ready to be publicly announced, and he can yeah. perhaps share it with that those. That sounds awesome. Have I've never written sci-fi before, so when you get when you finally get you know like paid to write sci-fi, you just think what it's like a laborious process of trying to figure out how fast the ships can be allowed to go because they need to go <laughs> kind of conveniently fast but not not too fast otherwise people start asking questions so yeah my and ships the thing, don't go fast the thing about the expanse like it was all yeah. reasonable physics yeah. like the light delay was the thing that they had to factor in yeah, because you have to, yeah. there's always a gimme in sci-fi you're just going yeah, yeah that's a thing but we can you know keep all the rest I mean, I've broken a few of the sci-fi no-no rules already. Like, I'll tell you up front, my 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 story does include uh, sort of crystals or gems that essentially act as a clean energy source that's kind of infinite, and that's considered to be a big no-no in sci-fi because it's so derivative and it's so overdone. But on the other hand, it's who cares? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to be a best-selling sci-fi author, so yeah, I'll just write whatever know. I want. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Well, right. um, we'll we'll wrap up there. As I, as I said at the beginning, uh, we're going to be taking a break for a little while, um, and we will let you know when we know what we're, when we're coming back and what we're doing. Um, so thank you very much for all the people who joined and a lot of engagement this evening. Really nice to see everyone in the chat. It's been really nice. And again, thank you to Tom. That was absolutely fascinating. So uh, we will say good night, and we'll see you when we see you. So good night, people. Bye-bye, everyone.